this book to connect. Good morning once again, and I'd like to welcome those that are now joining us on our live stream. And so today, as we continue in our journey through the Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Matthew, and we'll be reading from uh, chapter 16, and we'll begin with verse 15. Just to set the stage for what's going on, Jesus has gone into the region of Caesarea Philippi with his disciples, and he has just asked them, who do people say that I am? And they answer, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus makes it personal, and we read in verse 15, he says, but what about you? Who do you say? I am. And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you acknowledging that we are utterly and totally dependent upon you. I confess, Lord, that I can never begin to teach this word in the flesh. I ask, Lord, that you would just Anoint me with your Holy Spirit that you would give everything that you would have to be shared. I ask for your cleansing, that you'd make me a vessel that is fit for your use. For I acknowledge my sins to you. Wash me thoroughly in the blood of Christ, O Lord. I pray for each one that is listening today, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak to their hearts. For Lord, I know that... I can't do that, but you're the one who does. And so we yield ourselves up before you, just saying, here I am, Lord. Speak to me. And Lord, we ask that you will be the one honored through what we do today. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Now today, as we continue in our journey through the Bible, we come to the first account of the gospel. Now, the word gospel means good news. And as we've seen, there are four accounts giving us a four-dimensional view of who Jesus is. And so today, we will be looking at Matthew's view. Now, Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples, but he wasn't always a disciple. Before becoming a disciple, he was Levi, the tax collector. And we don't know when his name was changed, but it was likely after coming to Jesus that because of this change in his life, he was given a new name. Your old life is behind you and you have a new life now as a follower of Christ. And of all the disciples, Matthew probably gave up more than any others to follow Jesus, or at least what we would consider giving up more. Because being a tax collector and working for Rome, no doubt Matthew had amassed a fortune. And when he left that tax collector's booth to follow Jesus, he broke contract with Rome. And that job was gone forever. And yet Matthew was willing to leave it all behind to simply be with Jesus. Now Matthew is writing about the fact that Jesus is the promised coming king. And as he writes his book, there are three major sections and I love when this happens because each section can be identified by the repetition of this phrase, from that time on. Now we'll come back to that phrase a couple of times this morning. But as Matthew begins presenting the promised king to us, he wants us to understand that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And so naturally he begins with Jesus royal lineage, and he traces his genealogy, establishing the fact that Jesus has a legal right to the throne of David. He traces his ancestry all the way from Abraham right up to Joseph, the husband of Mary. Now, a couple of weeks ago in one of our Sunday school classes, the question was asked on that 
what does it matter? After all, Joseph wasn't Jesus' father. It's a good question, isn't it? And I think we do need to understand the fact that when Joseph accepted Jesus as his son, it gave Jesus a legal right to the throne as an heir of Joseph. And so Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus has that legal claim to the throne of David. Now, just to throw in a little bit here, when we come to the book of Luke, Luke will also give a genealogy of Jesus, only he traces it through Jesus' mother, Mary. And so there we find Jesus is a genealogical descendant of David. And so he has his legal right through Joseph and a genealogical right to the throne through Mary with that. And so after setting the stage that Jesus is the promised Messiah, Matthew gives us a record of the birth of Jesus. And we discover once again that Jesus is the king. The story tells us about a young woman. Her name was Mary. And Mary was a pure young woman, and she was a virgin and unmarried. And yet she conceives through the Holy Spirit, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. Now Joseph is having a hard time with Mary's story. He's just never heard a story like this before. And he's just about to divorce her, which is what you did in his world when you were engaged. And an angel appears to him in a dream and lets him know that what is taking place is through the Holy Spirit. And that he is to take Mary as his wife. And that she will give birth to a son. And you, you Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. And in that birth narrative we discover Jesus is Emmanuel. He is the king of kings. He is God with us. And that he is the Savior. The name Jesus means Savior. And Jesus came into this world to save us from our sins. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the next event that Matthew tells us about is the visit of the Magi. They have seen a star in the east. And they went to Jerusalem looking for the one born, the King of the Jews. And when Herod hears about another king, he is quite disturbed. And in fact, it says in all Jerusalem with him. When Herod became disturbed, everyone was disturbed. And so he inquires of the teachers of the law where the Christ was to be born. And they tell him in Bethlehem. And so Herod instructs the Magi that when you find the child, come and report to me so that I too may go and worship him, all along intending to kill Christ's child. And so the Magi, after they have seen Christ and they worshiped him and opened up their treasures to him, they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. And Herod figures out that he's been outwitted. And so he now has another plan. And he issues a decree that all of the boys to and under in the vicinity of Bethlehem are to be executed, put to death, murdered. And so Joseph is warned in a dream that he is to take the child and his mother and that they are to escape to Egypt. And they stay in Egypt until Herod dies. Roughly three to four years. Now, most biblical scholars believe that Jesus, when he was born, it was about two years old before the wise men 
appeared. They didn't come to see Jesus in the stable. They came to a house when you read the account. And then he flees to Egypt. And so when they come back from Egypt, Jesus is roughly five to six years old. And they don't come back to Bethlehem because Herod's relatives are still on the throne. And they decide things will be safer to go back home to Nazareth. And Jesus grows up in Nazareth once again, fulfilling the promises of the scriptures. And Matthew doesn't say anything about the next 25 or so years of Jesus' life. In fact, we fast forward through that time period until John the Baptist comes on the scene. And John is the forerunner of the Christ, the forerunner of the promised king, the one spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, preaching a message of repentance and proclaiming, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one more powerful than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then Jesus comes to be baptized by John. Now you have to remember, John has already said that I baptize you with water for repentance. Repentance is when we have a change of mind about sin. And so when Jesus comes, John recognizes that there is no sin in Christ. He'll later identify him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so when Jesus comes to be baptized, John tries to deter him and he says, I ought to be baptized by you. John recognizes, I'm a sinner, you're not. Why would you come to me? And, of course, Jesus tells him these things must be done. And the reason Jesus is identified is not because he's a sinner, but because he's identifying with you and me. Because we are sinners. That's why he came, was to identify with us. And so as soon as Jesus came up out of the waters, the heavens were opened, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove, not as a dove, like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven that spoke and said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And right after that, Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted. And Satan is going to test him and hit him with everything that he has for 40 days and 40 nights. And Matthew records three of those temptations. Now I think there's a tendency on our part when we read this to think that Jesus was tempted three times. What Matthew is doing is he's taking three of the temptations that show us that Satan hit Jesus on every level of our human existence. During those 40 days and nights, I think Satan hit Jesus with everything that he had. He threw it all at him. And so Matthew records these three, wanting us to know how Jesus is tempted just as we are tempted because there are those temptations that take place physically. The temptations of the flesh. The temptations of the body. And so after fasting for 40 days. The tempter comes to him and says. If you're the son of God. Tell these stones to become bread. That's on the physical level. But he just didn't hit him physically. Then he went to the level of our soul. That's the realm of our emotions and our experiences. And our ego is a part of that. And he comes and he says to him after he takes him to the highest point of the temple. He says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. And then he even quotes scripture to Jesus. 
And he's saying, you throw yourself down and God delivers you, then you'll be famous. Instant success. And who in their soul doesn't want instant success? We love the word instant in our life. And then he takes him to that third level, the deepest level of our human existence, the spirit. And he takes Jesus to a high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and he says, all of this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Remember, Jesus is the coming king and Satan is saying, I've got a shortcut for you. You bow down and worship me and you will instantly become king of it all. No cross. This is a major shortcut. And all it requires is for you to simply bow down and worship me. And so how does Jesus respond? Every time he blocks Satan with the word of God. Okay, that's why we've got to get into the word. That's how we fight these battles. And Jesus every time quotes scripture to him. Man doesn't live on bread alone. Tempt not the Lord your God. Worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you worship. And so after 40 days of hitting Jesus with everything that He has, Satan departed. And we now come to that first transition. In chapter 4, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Did you catch the similarity between John's message and Jesus's? John is preaching, repent for the coming king. And Jesus is preaching, repent for the coming kingdom. He's the king and he has a kingdom. And so Matthew presents the ministry of the king and the preaching about the kingdom in this section. And Jesus' very first act that inaugurates his ministry is the calling of his disciples. The same call he issues today. Come, follow me. And then he begins his ministry in the Galilee, teaching and preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing and casting out demons. And I think all too often we get this idea that Jesus' ministry was focusing on the healings and the miracles that took place. But here we find out that the real focus of Jesus' ministry is about preaching about the kingdom. And so Matthew records for us the longest sermon that Jesus preached in the Bible. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. I think we sometimes get the idea that the whole Sermon on the Mount was the Beatitudes. And that's where it begins. But that's just the beginning of this sermon. It keeps going on. And after the Beatitudes, you have the similitudes where Jesus compares us to the salt of the earth and the light to the world. But the bulk of his message was on the law. He talks about murder and adultery, divorce and oaths, forgiveness and love, charity and prayer, fasting and money, worry and judging others. And he closes out that message with instructions about life in the kingdom. And then we read this amazing phrase. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. Authority. Jesus has the authority of a king. It's in that sermon he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. 
You've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you that if you hate your brother, you've murdered him in your heart. He's the authority of the king, even the king over the law, the king over the Old Testament. And following this sermon of Jesus, he then presents to us the power of the king. And we do see his power in the miracles. We have Jesus healing a man with leprosy, something that has only happened one time in the scriptures. And that was a long time ago in the Old Testament. A long time ago. And now Jesus comes on the scene. You even have a centurion, a Roman soldier who has enough faith in Jesus that he asked him to heal his servant. And then you have Peter, or Peter, Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. And he calms the sea. Quiet. Be still. He has authority over nature. He has authority over demons. And it's here that he has the authority to forgive sins. The paralytic is lowered before Jesus through the roof of a home and he looks at him and he says, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. Only God can forgive sins. See, the miracles were all intended to demonstrate on a physical level what Jesus can do on a much deeper spiritual level in our life. It's here that we see the compassion of Jesus. As we read, he looked on the crowds and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And then Jesus proclaims, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He needs help. And that's what he's called disciples for. And so Jesus, the king, delegates his power to his disciples. It's what they've been trained for. It's what disciples are to be training for. It's for living life in the kingdom and doing the ministry of Jesus. And so we read in chapter 10, he called the twelve. And he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And he gives them some final instructions and he sends his disciples out to do ministry. And after that, Jesus heads back into the Galilee to teach and to preach. Have you noticed most of Jesus' ministry takes place in the Galilee? I think another thing, we get this idea that so much of it happened in Jerusalem and it didn't. Most of it takes place in the area of the Galilee and he's teaching and he's preaching again. And by now... The Pharisees are plotting how they might kill Jesus. They're ready to be done with him. And then we encounter another change. It's a change in the way that Jesus teaches. And for the first time, he employs the use of parables. Parables about the kingdom. And we often get this idea that Parables are stories to help simplify a message so we can understand it. I remember when I was in seminary and some courses that I've taken on preaching. And they say that we need to preach like Jesus did. And Jesus used stories so that people could understand the message. That's wrong. That's not what's going on here. Because when Jesus begins using parables, the disciples come to him and they ask him, Why are you teaching the people in parables? They didn't understand the parables. It becomes apparent as you continue reading. Jesus had to explain the parables to his disciples. The crowds don't understand them. And so they come and they ask him, why are you teaching the people in parables? And Jesus tells them the parables are a way of hiding a message. And he tells why. Chapter 13, verse 15. The people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. And so for the parables are for those who really want to understand the message of the kingdom. They're not little stories to open it up for everyone. They're there to hide the truth so that those who are seeking the truth 
will find it. And many of the parables deal with the consequences of rejecting Jesus. Because now the people are rejecting their king. In chapter 13, 57, Jesus says, Only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. They were ready to stone him in Nazareth. And the house of Israel has rejected him as their king. Shortly after that, he gets word that John the Baptist has been beheaded. And Jesus tells about John the Baptist being the forerunner. And just exactly what kind of man he was and the praise that he has for John. And then Jesus feeds the 5,000. And he does so with such little resources of five loaves of bread and two fish. And later that same evening, Jesus walks on the water. He even invites Peter out on the water. Now, I know we all know Peter sank. But my question is how many of us would even get out of the boat? Peter may have lacked in faith, but Peter had more faith than most did. And the only thing that happened to Peter is he took his eyes off Jesus. And then we read about his confrontation with the Pharisees once again. You see, it's growing. The temperature is going up each time. There's a confrontation now with Jesus and the religious leaders. But then he has a refreshing moment that comes into his life when he meets a Canaanite woman, a Gentile woman who has more faith than most of the people that he's encountered in Israel. And then he feeds the 4,000. And for those that have wondered, well, which was it, 4,000 or 5,000, Matthew records both. It wasn't one or the other. Jesus fed the multitudes two times with that. And then he has another confrontation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then when he's alone with his disciples, Jesus warns them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We learn in the parables that yeast is a symbol of something that is disruptive, something corruptive. In other words, it's a picture of evil. It's a picture of sin. He says, you watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. What's their yeast? Well, it's hypocrisy. For them, it was all about religion and had nothing to do about a relationship with God. God's not interested in religion. He wants a relationship. They've got it all wrong. And if you give in to their way of teaching, you're going to think that God's only concerned about the externals in our life. God's concerned about the heart. And the Sadducees, they were the rationalists. And there's nothing wrong with being rational. It's a lot better than being irrational. But they took it to the point that they never believed in the activity of God. Faith wasn't a part of being a Sadducee. And faith is how we please God in our life. Without faith, it's impossible. And so he says, beware of that that yeast that comes from these groups. And after that, Jesus enters into the region of Caesarea Philippi. That's getting almost to the furthest region that you can get in all of Israel. And it's there that he asked his disciples, as we read earlier, who do people say that I am? Prompting Peter's confession. You are the Christ. And after we read that, we come to the second transition. It takes us into the third section of the book when we read, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus' message now takes a turn towards the cross. Oh, he may have hinted at it along the way, but now it becomes clear. 
and he plainly tells his disciples what's coming. He's going to Jerusalem and he's going to suffer and he's going to be killed. But he also tells them that he's going to be raised to life on the third day. And he then instructs them on what true discipleship looks like. Anyone who wants to follow me, he says, must take up their cross and follow me. Not buy a piece of jewelry. But it's just like Levi. You're willing to leave everything to follow Jesus. And it doesn't matter what it's going to cost. That's what true discipleship looks like. And then he tells them that after he dies, he's coming again. There is that second coming of Christ. And six days later, we read about Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain. He goes up on a large mountain and he takes three of the disciples with him. Peter, James, and John. And while on the mountain, his face shines like the sun and his clothes become as white as light. And Moses and Elijah appear, and they talk with Jesus. A bright cloud envelops them, and a voice says, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Just a subtle difference between when he was baptized, isn't it? But now he's at the end of his ministry and the message to us as disciples of Jesus because after hearing the message and coming to Jesus and being prepared to be disciples, he says, listen to him. Do exactly what he's telling you to do. After that, Jesus begins instructing his disciples on a variety of subjects. He tells them about faith, that genuine faith is something that can move mountains. He talks about humility, that the greatest in the kingdom of God are going to be those who have the humility of a child. He even talks about taxes, and then forgiveness, and divorce, and discipleship. And once again, he talks about his second coming, but he also talks about his death. In Matthew 20, 18, he says, we're going to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. And now they've headed towards Jerusalem. And then when they arrive in Jerusalem, it is the final week of Jesus' life. We often call it the Passion Week. On Sunday, Jesus enters the city triumphantly. We call it Palm Sunday because the people laid palm branches in front of him. Perhaps a better title would be King Sunday because Jesus enters as a king. And then on Monday, he goes to the temple and he sees the corrupt activity that's going on with the money changers and the merchants. And so he cleanses the temple. And then we come to Tuesday. And Tuesday was an extremely busy day. It would have been an exhausting day. It begins early in the morning as on their way into Jerusalem. And Jesus sees a fig tree that is unfruitful. And so he curses it. I think it's a lesson on discipleship. He doesn't have any need for an unfruitful disciple. And then he goes to the temple. And while at the temple, he has another confrontation with the teachers of the law, and they challenge his authority. And so Jesus uses some very pointed parables. Parables pointing right at them, the religious leaders. And it's here that Jesus preaches his most blistering sermon. Anyone who didn't ever think that Jesus didn't ever preach a tough sermon hasn't read this one. It contains seven woes. 
And it goes something like this. Woe unto you Pharisees and you teachers of the law. You blind guides, you brood of snakes, you serpents. And he compares them to being whitewashed tombs. It was a big hit. And after that, Jesus leaves Jerusalem, goes down across the Kidron Valley, right up onto the Mount of Olives, and there he teaches his, discern his disciples about his second coming, his coming as king. See, this coming is Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, the Savior. But he is coming back as king. And then later that night, Jesus was anointed by a woman who had an alabaster jar of expensive perfume. Wednesday, nothing is recorded. You get the impression that after Tuesday, it was a day of rest. Just a time to be with his disciples. If you've ever had a Tuesday like Jesus did, you need a Wednesday off. And especially when you know what's coming on Thursday. Thursday doesn't end. Thursday comes and Jesus has the Passover with his disciples in the upper room. Following that, he once again goes down across the Kidron Valley up onto the Mount of Olives, and he enters into the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays. Father, if there's any way possible, let this cup pass from me. And as he prays, Judas arrives. And he betrays Jesus with a kiss. Jesus is arrested and he's taken to the high priest. And Thursday becomes Friday. And early in the night hours, Jesus is tried by the Sanhedrin. And it's at this time also that Peter out in the courtyard denies Jesus. Three times, I don't know the man. Morning comes and Jesus is taken before Pilate to be tried again. Eventually he's handed over to the soldiers where Jesus is mocked, he's beaten, he's given a crown of thorns, and he's led away to be crucified. Jesus was crucified at about 9 a.m. And then at 3 o'clock, he breathed his last. He gave up the spirit and he died. And the Roman centurion, not a disciple who was standing there, says, Surely this is the Son of God. Sabbath is almost arriving. Jesus has died. And so we meet a man we've never met before, a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. He asks for Jesus' body and he takes him and he buries him in his own tomb. And then Saturday comes. It's the Sabbath. And nothing is going on. It's a day of silence. If you're a disciple, it's a day of great darkness. But then, Sunday, at the dawn of the day, the women come to the tomb, and there's an earthquake, and there's an angel that is there, and he rolls the stone away, not to let Jesus out, but so they can see the tomb is empty. He is alive. He is risen just as he said he would. Go and tell his disciples. And then Matthew closes with Jesus' final instructions. We call it the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely 
I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus is the promised king. I encourage you, get into the book. There's no way I can tell you everything Matthew talks about. That is one of the most challenging things here is how do you leave anything out? Because it's all important. And this is the greatest message we can ever hear. It is the good news. And our king has come. And he's coming again. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we come before you and we thank you so much for Matthew's account of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that this message will become a constant part of our lives. And it's in that precious name of our King Jesus that we pray. Amen. And this morning we will be sharing in uh, communion together. Let me move this. At Belleville, we practice open communion, which means that it is open to everyone. Uh, if you haven't yet received your communion cup, uh, we use the little ones just to be safe for right now. If you need one, uh, just lift up a hand. Scott will see to it that you uh, get one of those right now. As we talked about this evening, on that Thursday evening, Jesus did meet in the upper room with his disciples. And he shared that he had had a tremendous desire to share this Passover with them. It will become a time of great revelation for them and for something we have remembered and celebrated through the centuries. Because it was on that night in the upper room that Jesus took the bread. And as we've talked about before, there was nothing unusual about that. But what was unusual that evening is when Jesus went off the script. Because the Seder never said anything like, this is my body. And then he blessed it. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the bread that came down out of heaven. Not as our fathers ate and died, but that whoever eats this bread lives forever. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. The one who is identified as the bread of life. The one who gave his body for our redemption. And it's in his precious name we pray, amen. And then he broke it. After that, Jesus took the cup. There were four cups that evening. It was probably the cup of redemption. And again, he goes off script because he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he blessed it. Oh Lord, we know in your word that It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. And yet it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. We thank you and we praise you for the one that John identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The one who poured out his blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
I invite you at this time, if you will, to take your communion. There are two layers on here. It begins with a cellophane layer. If you just separate it there and pull it back, it'll bring forth the wafer. The body of Christ broken for you. Now, if you peel back the foil, and for those that haven't done this, you do want to do it gently and carefully. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And now invite us to all stand for our closing song. <laughs>